for the well. Okay, good. That was a coffee house in Mendocino on uh, Ukiah Street. And um, I was really impressed with his music. We became friends and have been friends ever since. And this is the fifth time uh, that Pierre has come back to the coast since then. And I'm really pleased to bring him here for your enjoyment. He's uh, celebrating his 40th year touring, um, recording, uh, composing. Uh, so he's, he's had a long and very uh, august career so far, and it's far from over. So I uh, welcome you, and please put your hands together for Pierre Bensuzan. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Right now, I am um, reading a book um, 
by a French um, novelist. It's about uh, Cardinal of Richelieu, who was um, Louis XIII's main minister, and they together ruled France at the time when dangers <coughs> came from Spain and England, and so it's, there is a lot of. Uh, Sometimes I'm imagining what kind of um, people, person I would have been if I had been living at that time, if I would have been a, a musician or a, a burglar, <laughs> a soldier. I have no idea. But um, music helps sometimes to try to figure it out.
a, a text coming from a poem by a very a great single songwriter from Paris by the name of Jacques Jeunin. In fact, we, we wrote that song together. I would like to sing another poem for you by another poet um, who lived a few years before. His name was Victor Hugo. <laughs> Everybody in America knows Victor Hugo because of Walt Disney, I guess. <laughs> and the miserabilis. <laughs> The good thing with French is that when French would have completely disappeared, it would still be spoken here in England and America. <laughs> I would like to translate for you what Mr. Hugo wrote in this poem. It's called Demain de l'Aube, Tomorrow at Dawn. Tomorrow, at dawn, at the time when the country becomes whiter, I will leave. I know you're waiting for me. I will go by the forest, I will go by the mountain. I cannot stay away from you any longer. I will walk with my eyes fixed on my thoughts without seeing nothing outside, without hearing no noise. Alone and known, my back bent, my hands crossed, and the day for me will be like night. Now that Paris, its cobblestones and marble, and its haze, and rooftops are far away from my eyes, and now that I can see the branches of trees, and that I can think about the beauty of the skies, now softened by those divine spectacles, plains, rocks, forest, valleys, silver rivers, looking at how small I am and looking at all your miracles, I come back to my senses in front of this immensity. We only see one side of things, the other dives into darkness of a frightful mystery. Man carries his burden without even knowing the causes. Everything he sees is short useless and fleeting. Et c'est 
ça brûle et ces toits sont bien loin de mes yeux. Sentimental pyromaniacs. <laughs> and she knows her name every time I call her. Sentimental pyromaniacs! She comes to me. <laughs> There is a story behind it, but I will tell you another time. <coughs> What? <laughs> I'm telling you a lot already. <laughs> You have to imagine what the story is. Thank you. 
silent passenger. You notice I said song, not instrumental, huh? <laughs> well, most of what I play is is a song, in fact. But I'm very lazy with lyrics, and I, I'm not. I don't think I'm that good to write lyrics. But uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong. But <clears throat> in fact, I have a wife who who writes beautiful lyrics, so I'm very spoiled at home, and I will sing for you some of what she writes. But right now, I would like to sing in what I call emergency singing. Thank you. 
for you a, a song directly inspired by the music of Antonio Carlos Jobim. There is a one of his composition which does like this. Yeah? I'm going to do exactly the same notes. And then I take a deviation. I respect. I didn't do it on purpose, but there is a moment when I knew I was sort of taking that melody from him. And you know, he's, he's in heaven. And I spoke to him and I said, How do you feel about it? He said, I feel very good. <laughs> Same thing with Victor Hugo, you know, Victor Hugo didn't want... <laughs> no, it's true. He didn't want people to take his lyrics, I mean, his words, poems, and put music on it. So I asked him and he said, no problem. <laughs> I always ask, I'm very polite.
before to take a little break, I would like to play and sing one more for you. It's a cross between uh, Celtic, Chinese, Jazz, Cuban, Brazilian, <laughs> and uh, music from Mongolia. <laughs> and French. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Today was a special day. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Reminds me of, uh, at, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, I was touring um, in, the, in the West Coast and with my friend, oops, Jared, who is there. Hi, Jared. Jared is my road manager, my companion on the road on the roads of North America, which is, as you know, not a country, but a continent. <laughs> I do feel a lot of sympathy for truck drivers. Because I'm just one of them, I think. We have, we have a lot of common points, let's put it that way. Uh, two years ago, we were driving uh, to Oregon, and we stopped upstate California somewhere and had a bite to eat. And uh, we were sitting next to a couple, they were like us waiting for their, for their order. And um, I had to write a letter. Yeah, a letter, I didn't say an email, I said a letter with an envelope, pen, a piece of white paper. And so I wanted to say the date, and I, I didn't know which day we were. You know. So I'm asking the lady next to me, I said, would you please tell me which day is today? He said, oh gee, today. And she looked at her husband, and he was looking at her. And she looked at me and said, oh, but of course, today is March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> oh, thank you, I forgot St. Patrick's Day. And then I, I thought, hmm, St. Patrick's. And souvenirs, you know, started to, to come back to my mind. And I wanted to sort of engage a little conversation with her. And I said, oh. Have you been to Ireland? No. Oh, I said, you know, I, I was in fact in the city of Downpatrick, in the north, you know, in Northern Ireland. This is where, you know, Patrick is down. And she started looking at me like if I was coming from a different planet. <laughs> and me, I was trying to be engaging, you know, so, you know, say, yeah, it's in County Down. And no reaction, and her, her husband was in fact closing himself even more. Like I was, I was sort of figuring that they were waiting for their food silently. <laughs> so then I, I made my 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 souvenirs my own, you know, and I remembered a morning with my friend George Loudon, George Loudon, who built that guitar, mm. dear friend. And George and I, we were sort of walking by a morning. It was sunny, which is not very often in Northern Ireland. It was very sunny. We had a little pint, and we took our pint out of the pub. And um, we decided to walk a little bit around, 
there it's okay. You can have your pint in, you know, and walk in the street and no cops is going to come and put you in jail. <laughs> Which is sort of, it tells you a little bit about, you know, the culture there. Um, and we walk and we see that church and there was a graveyard. I sit on one grave, which was very comfortable, I have to say, and he sits on another one, and we start talking about life and this and that. And I say, so George, tell me something. Down, Patrick, count it down. I, all of a sudden, it makes sense to me. This is related to St. Patrick. He said, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, okay. So, he's buried here in Down, Patrick? He said, yeah. But where? And he says, just underneath, underneath your butt. <laughs> this is what I wanted to share with that woman. <laughs> she did not allow me to. No. She missed something. And I'm sure her day would have been a, a more, more joyful day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good story, no? <laughs> you don't invent those stories. <laughs> no. Celtic music happened when I was, I think, 13 or 14. I was hitchhiking my way to Brittany to a folk festival. My first ever folk festival. And I had my guitar with me and uh, a guy stopped in a deux chevaux station wagon de chevaux. That's very, very rare. He had a beard and he smokes a pipe and he says, where do you go? I said, I go to Kertag. He says, oh, me too. Come. So we go to Kertag and we, we go to that festival. And that festival is organized by a woman who lives in a castle. And he happens to be friend with that woman. So we go to the castle. Here I am in the castle with all the musicians invited to the festival. Me and my guitar, and I'm 13. And people are getting like, who is this kid? Yeah, who is this kid? I'm just a, a hitchhiker, you know? And I hear a band, four guys, and also Alan Stivell was there, and his musicians were chiming with that band. And those, those guys, they were a little bit red, long hair, and they were playing in a sort of energy which implied that you would have to sort of switch them off so that they would stop playing. <laughs> if you don't do that, they keep on playing. Forever. The perpetual movement. I, it exists. I've seen it. And that band was Planksteen. And um, the irony, the beautiful thing, is that I became friends with almost all of them in the years later in my life. But then they were very new to me. And at night, they, um, they played in front of 15,000 people on a field. And all of a sudden, there was a, a strike, a power strike. No more light, no more sound. And people just uh, hold their breath, and they didn't stop playing. He just went on playing, and we could hear it vividly. I've never forgotten that, you know. So I would like to play a bit of um, uh, tribute to that moment. My little Celtic medley for today, St. Patrick's Day. I, haven't, I play this one only once a year. <laughs> so we'll see what's going to come out. And I would like to play it for you, Jean. Jean Parsons. Hey. My hero. You're my hero, Pierre. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I've been listening to Jean's music about that same time. And one day we met in Amsterdam. I was, you know, playing bluegrass with Bill Keith. And Bill said, you know, I have my friends, the Flying Burrito Brothers, they are playing in Amsterdam, you know, hotel, you know, we have two days off, let's go. I said, the Flying Burrito Brothers. <laughs> no, I was 17, I was a little bit older. <laughs> and I met you, and, and at that time I had already your record monument, every note there. I've been listening to it like, and so I could not believe I met him then, and I cannot believe that almost 40 years later we became the best friends. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> well, the thing is, nothing is my music. I'm a robber of notes. <laughs> I steal them, but I give them back. <laughs> for an email. <laughs> I'm checking, but I try to be discreet about it. I, I, I apologize. I, don't to, um, I hope it does not. No, no problem. It's not too obvious. I hope. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop. No, it's true. You know, you're right. I can't wait a little bit. <laughs> you know, I'll be home soon. <laughs> what time is it now? <laughs> oh, gee. Okay. I have to play until 10 and then curfew. It's 15 minutes. 15 minutes. This is ridiculous. And you know, I'm going to drink some water, so it's like 14 minutes. <laughs> so, this song I just played is a big hit in China. It's a Chinese gospel. 
that is called Wu Wei. And I'm going to play this song for them soon. In fact, uh, in July, I'm going for the second time to mainland China, to Beijing, Wuxi, Hong Kong. So I'm practicing my, my Chinese right now. I know two words. I might learn a third one. Some years ago, in fact, uh, in the last century, I met Michael Hedges. We were, um, the first time we met, we were doing a double bill show in San Diego. And um, it was great, and, um, and we had another show lined up. In Cupertino? That year. And we, we didn't play together in San Diego because, I don't know, it was just the first time, you know, but that other show was in <coughs> Cupertino. Palo Alto. In 83. And Randy Luch, who is here, organized it. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you, Pierre. Um, and we played together then. We played uh, Come Together and Watermelon Man. <laughs> and yeah. Us, you know, it was... <clears throat> it was great. And we, we kept bumping into each other once in a while. We did on two other shows together, one in uh, Oklahoma City in his hometown, and another one at the, the Jazz Festival in Montreal. That was the last time we played together. And then um, um, Don Ross, who's a common friend to Michael and I, uh, came to my concert in Buffalo, New York, and said, you know, Pierre, I've seen Michael not too long ago, so I came to your concert, but he's playing tonight in Buffalo. I said, oh, what? He said, you know, after your concert, let's pack soon and let's go to his concert. I said, fantastic, yeah, let's do that. So I did a very short uh, second set, 10 minutes, you know. <laughs> no, it's not true, I would never do something like that. But anyway, I, I finished and uh, I had much more things than day, you know, so Don gave me a hand. And then we went to the Truff, Truff, Truff Famadori Cafe, and Michael just finished his, his concert. And um, he was all sweating, you know, and everybody had this, an experience, you know, they, everyone was coming out like, <laughs> you know. And uh, that, was, that was interesting. And then Michael comes, and uh, we hang out for an hour drinking a beer. He asked me to play some guitar. So I take the guitar and I play some guitar for him. And then he comes to me privately and he says, we have to be serious about playing together and tour. I said, nothing would make me happier. Let's do it. Said, yeah, we get in touch. That has never happened. <laughs> but, um, I have been imagining what it could have been to play with him. And meanwhile, I've been trying to recreate him in music with his song called Solomon Michael. <clears throat> Thank you. 
I would like to sing for you a song. Then I'm going to be late. Is it okay? No. I like to. I like to do one more. Uh, two more, in fact, two more. The song that Dorothea, my wife, and I wrote together. It's called Les Voiles Catalanes.
so much. Before to play a last song, I would like you to put your hand together for our promoter, for my very long time friend, Denny Dawson. I'm taking you with me to the Pyrenees. How about that? You know where are the Pyrenees? This is this big chain of mountain bordering, f splitting France and Spain. You know, in the 30s, a lot of Spanish people came to France to go away from the civil war there. This story is ironic sometimes. The same thing could happen in a few years. A lot of French people might go away from France and cross the border and go to Spain for the very same reasons. I will say no more. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, that would be okay. My whistling teacher always did, did tell me, I remember, Pierre always drink a bit of water before to whistle. <laughs> you didn't know that I took whist whistle lessons? <laughs> I'm lying, I never took whistle <laughs> But I did meet this whistling teacher. Rebecca from um, Columbus, Ohio, and she happened to be American whistling champion. <laughs> you have to, this is only in America that you have a whistling champion. <laughs> Nowhere else in the world you have a whistling champion. So I said, Rebecca, who are you whistling with? Oh, with a symphony orchestra in town. In fact, sorry, it was not Columbus, it was Cleveland. There was a great symphony orchestra in Cleveland, Ohio. So she was whistling the oboe parts, the flute parts, the violin parts. We, my friend Doug and myself, we, we stayed that night after my show at her place and her family, and she said, for breakfast tomorrow, before you hit the trail, I would like to show you something. So we, we had breakfast, and then we are ready to go, and she said, okay, follow me. We follow her. Her house is on Lake Harry. Uh, shore of the lake, very beautiful house. And we follow her and as we are making our way towards the water, we see birds coming in our direction and some of them are already there waiting for something. And then more and more birds are flying in our direction and just land where we are. And she looked at us with a little smile and she sort of whistled birds music, sort of recognition sign, you know, like, hey, I'm one of you, you know. What a, wait a minute, don't be so in a rush. She, she sort of said that to them because they were starving, and every day she was feeding them, every morning at that very moment. So there were maybe 200 birds there. Hitchcock next to, you know, was that was nothing. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I know it was filmed here, but sorry, no. But the, the, the reality was that it was not at all creepy. <laughs> Great birds, you know, like, wow, and she, she was one of them. She was whistling like them. And she said, this is what I wanted you to see before you go. Oh, I never forgot that. I have to take advantage, no email for a couple of hours, it's like a blessing. Back in 79, the first time I, I came to Mendocino, there was no email. How did we do? No iPhone, no fax, just a pen, paper. I had my car, my kingdom for a car. 
was a dark, dark purple with a white roof. <laughs> and I remember I left Mendocino, I had to make my way back to the East Coast, and I stopped in Reno, and as I, I stopped in Reno, I wanted to stop at a traffic light. And the pedal was just all the way, and the car didn't stop. That's very strange. <laughs> And um, the next day I went to a garage and he said, you have no more brakes. I said, yes, thanks, I know. <laughs> uh, but in fact, no, I mean, you have no more brakes. Well, where do you need to go, he says to me. I said, well, I need to go to Boston. <laughs> How much would it cost, I asked, you know. Oh, $200. I can fix them for $200. That was the price of the car. <laughs> I said, that's, that's not possible. I cannot spend that money, you know. He said, you know, how sad a, a young French guitar player dying in a car crash, you know, but that's your call, he said. I said, are you sure that this is so bad? He said, no, just don't use them. I said, well, this is my intention. I'm not going to use them then, you know. So, you know, I was 21. And so I didn't know better, but I knew something. I knew that on a motorway in America, you don't need your brakes. <laughs> and I was going to do mostly motorway, you know. And then I took an hitchhiker. He spent two years in jail, and he was on his way back to Demo in Ohio. So I said to him, I'm sorry, I need to see if you have a driving license, because I need to be there at this time, and so I will need you to help me with the driving. He said, oh, no problem. This is my driving license. And I said, oh, there is another information I need to tell you. Do not use the brakes. He was fine with that. There were two of us, you know, and I did not use the brakes. And I remember the garage intendant in Reno said to me, when you will be in Wyoming, you are going to drive at night. Watch out the antelopes. Okay, watch out the antelopes. What about the antelopes? Oh, because they love crossing the road. And? We just don't use the brakes. <laughs> I said, I, I, I will not use my brakes. It's okay. So I drove all this time waiting for an antelope to cross my road. And I was sort of fantasizing about the antelope. How does it look like for me to start with? I never saw an antelope. I never seen an antelope in my life, you know. And then the night goes by. The night goes by, daybreak. My hitchhiker is, is sleeping and I'm driving. It's beautiful, Wyoming, beautiful. And all of a sudden, a mother antelope crosses the road with her baby. In fact, no, sorry, she's not crossing the road. I am crossing her road, sorry. So I'm crossing her road and she's not. And I just have the time to do whoop. That's it. <laughs> what do you need brakes for? <laughs> okay, I go back to the Pyrenees now. To the castle of Montségur, the, the safe mountain. Built in the 12th century. And the crusaders on their way to Jerusalem stopped there to try to take it. So the first year they could not take it, the second year they did. And there were, inside of that castle, 500 heretics who were challenging the church of that time so they could convert again or accept to be burnt. And they were all burnt, 500 people. Exciting. This is uh, the ground of this music.
Thank you.